So this evening is our well of being evening. And this is an evening in which we really uh, dedicate ourselves to cultivating the sources of inner resilience. And Chandra and I checked in with each other um, earlier this weekend, and we had a little talk about what should we offer? What is really meaningful right now? What might really be supportive? Um, and we used our tools as first person investigators to focus on, well, what do we need right now? And how might that maybe reflect what's going on for other folks in the Dharma community? And we really felt this resonance to the full moon and what the full moon has to teach us, which is that there is a fullness and abundance, which is here. And sometimes that fullness is less apparent in other phases and other circumstances, almost to the point that we don't see it. And for those of us who are city dwellers, I see many of you, of course, are from the city here and cities other, in other places, we even miss seeing the moon. So many other things distract us. And I had a beautiful experience um, on Monday night and taking a little evening walk when there's not many people out. And I saw the moon and got to practice beneath the moon and just was filled with a sense of so much, both longing and belonging. The moon invites such a sweet quality for us as we gaze upon it. There's this um, feeling that I get of a connection to all of my ancestors. Because I know there's one thing we've all shared in common, it's gazing at that moon with some kind of feelingfulness. I don't have the data at a research level to back that up, but I would make a very strong, uh, educated guess that the moon has been a source of deep feeling um, for as long as we've been alive here together. And I think what <clears throat> was really meaningful for me at that moment is, like many of you have spent um, so many hours in front of a screen, and it's a different kind of illuminated quality. I really would never call it luminous. It's just this other way that we're able to connect, and I'm so grateful for it. But there, staring at the moon and receiving that experience of the moon, there was a different kind of fullness, a different kind of um, feeling of connection. And I felt so grateful for that and really reminded me that that fullness is already here. So this evening, we're going to do a practice that reminds us of what is it that is unchanging? What is it that shows us the fullness of our own mind that's here? And Chandra and I were gonna share the evening together with different teachings. So I'm going to extend my teaching and also engage with you all in some um, questions and considerations. Before we get started, I wanted to present you all with uh, a couple requests, um, a couple, we could call them agreements or in some ways, you know, how are we going to decide to be in community here together? And, and my first request for you all, um, is these are essentially requests that actually mirror what are called the paramitas. Many of you are familiar with the paramitas. These are the spiritual qualities that really help us wake up on the path. And what's really interesting about these paramitas is I think they give us instruction on how we can also be here together. Um, I am going to paste them into the chat as an easier way to kind of connect with them together. And you will see, for better and for worse, the first one I am going to request, many of you on the first page have this, but I do request that you have your video camera on. Um, not only because I want to see your shining faces, and I really want to just connect with what is happening for you. I will read facial expression. Um, I will also just feel more moved and engaged. But it's also for you all. I don't know about you guys, but I have developed some really bad habits of attending things online. I'll turn off the camera, and then that means I can go get tea, and I can reorganize my shelves, and I'm kind of talking to other people, and one of the most important qualities is this discipline, right, of really applying and adhering ourselves to practice when we're here together. If you don't want to look at the screen, I totally get it. You're welcome to put your camera kind of in a side view so I could see your profile, but just for you to have that discipline of I'm here and I'm fully showing up. And it bleeds in nicely also to generosity. If we are here showing up for the practice and kind of held accountable, we're giving ourselves a full generosity of being here. 
we would never go to a Dharma center and sit down to meditate, but then decide to finish an email at work. And yet we can do that now. It's awesome and terrible. Uh, so my invitation to you all is to move towards the awesome side of that, which is really letting yourself sink in here. I am totally here. I'm going to be generous with myself. Um, and I'm just going to allow myself to, to show up and have my camera on and be accountable. The nice thing about this time, I don't know about you guys, but this is such a chaotic free fall in so many ways that we all get to wear sweatpants and be in our house and it gets to be in it's all sorts of disarray. So you can let go of all of those judgments right now and recognize here we all are struggling in the same way. Um, it never ceases, it hasn't ceased to kind of just blow my mind each day. And then non-harming, you know, so in these communities online, unfortunately, there's been instances of people, uh, not luckily with the Dharma Collective, but people, um, you know, sharing, oversharing, people maybe um, asking other participants for dates online, things that are just not what we're up for here. And when we think of non-harming, it's such a core principle of our Buddhist practice. It is such a hard thing to achieve. Can we go through even three hours of our morning without non-harming, without inner aggression, right? With really treating ourselves to that true peace of opening ourselves and feeling that tenderness and kindness to whatever we meet. So we bring that, of course, to our, our communication here. As much as possible, not only to our communication and text, we also bring it to our speech, to our inner speech, what we're thinking, right? Um, so that's part of our agreements here together. And then joyful enthusiasm. I feel very joyfully enthusiastic to be with you all. That's a very easy one for me. It's Sarasco Dharma Collective is such a beautiful part of um, my life. And it has become even more so in this time when we can sit together as practitioners. I don't know about you all, but I, I just, I don't even understand where I would be without practice right now. Um, and I'm not saying that practice is making everything anywhere near perfect, um, but it is making things somewhat tolerable. And it is giving me the context and foundation to know that I can transform this time into meaning. You know, that this is actually, no, it is actually, um, as some would say, the perfect ingredients for us to wake up together. And I really feel so much heart and so much ground in that. So we're going to practice together. And this is going to be a practice really intended for us to get as much as possible a glimpse of the unchanging nature of our mind. I really look forward to unpacking that with you, what unchanging nature of our mind. But we're going to first go into our experiential investigation of that. And that will be done through a process of really settling in deeply, settling into our body, settling our speech, settling our mind. Students of Alan Wallace and CEB will know that sequence quite, quite well. It really helps us arrive here together. And then what we'll do is essentially a very simple and yet very profound move of leaning back in our mind so that we can watch and know the nature of movement in our mind, while we can also hopefully find some kind of stillness together. So that's, that's gonna be our trajectory. So please go ahead and get whatever you need to be comfortable. See, the only advantage of having online Dharma is that we get all the pillows we want. We can like have all the space, you know, we're just like, you can have blankets. Some of us can have cats in our laps as we practice. Should you be so fortunate? Um, so just one last time welcoming you all here. Really happy to be here with you all. So let's just ease right in. Come and find the space of breath right as it's entering the body.
And for a couple moments here, let your attention wander wherever it would like to wander among your sense portals. So if you're noticing the warmth of a blanket, or if you're noticing some mental thought or image passing through, or you're noticing maybe a faint smell or sound, just let your mind gently and openly notice whatever is here, whatever is moving. And what you may notice is a mind that's busy with thoughts and ideas. And feel as though you were inviting your attention to just drop downwards into the knowingness of the body. Feel or imagine a quality somewhat like a waterfall of thoughts and memories, images and ideas, just gently cascading down, losing their power and releasing back to where they came from. And invite the body to settle into a quality of relaxation and ease. Feeling the softness, openness of the front and inviting an uprightness and strength up through the spine and the back. Relaxing and releasing residual tension from the day through the forehead and the brows. Softening as though you were unplugging the eyes. Softening through the cheekbones and the jaw. and softening around the throat and the neck and the shoulders. Gently inviting further relaxation in the body, not forcing any areas that are tight or heavy, just inviting and welcoming. Noticing if a quality of dropping down and in may start to be experienced through the belly and the chest. And 
and you may notice there's still an inner narrator. Marking what is happening and what's going on and invite your speech to settle. Maybe not be totally absent, but as though you were turning down the volume. No need to communicate what's happening to anyone. You can just be and experience moment to moment. and settle the mind as though it were a glass of water stirred up with sediment and dirt. As we settle the mind, all the sediment falls to the bottom and what naturally arises is clarity, stillness. Feel that sediment gently resting. And here with the body, speech and mind settled in their natural states. Give yourself the gentle refreshment of just noticing the breath. Noticing the breath in its own natural rhythm. Feel the breath completely as it enters the body. And feel the breath completely as it leaves the body, attending to each molecule of breath. So many simple things have become precious to us in this time. Feel the preciousness of breath, how fortunate we are to have each and every breath. And when the thoughts, memories, and images arise, just relax, release whatever has come to mind, and gently return, nourishing yourself with this simple application of your mindfulness to breathing. And here from this place of breath and presence, consider your intention for practicing together this evening. Your intention or aspiration can be quite personal and really related to this moment, seeking ground, 
seeking comfort. Or this intention and aspiration can be greater. How we want to be showing up right now in our life in general. An intention for unconditional compassion or complete openness. Consider an intention that's meaningful and allow it to be a guiding light for the practice and evening. And gently release that intention. And turn your attention inward to where that intention arose from, to the space of the mind. Many of us assume the space of the mind is between our eyes and within our head. But investigate for yourself whether this is true. Consider leaning back in your mind. As though you could see the great expansiveness in which our thoughts and memories and images, our ideas and plans arise. This is often called the sky-like nature of our mind. Feel that vastness. And notice, with great investigation and kindness, what comes into the space of the mind. And notice when a thought, memory, or image arises, how does it change and shift the space of the mind? The two simple practices here are noticing the space of the mind and noticing what arises within it. This is sometimes described as noticing the stillness of the mind amid the motion of our thoughts, our feelings. As though we were a hawk positioned against the wind, maintaining the same position even as the wind is whipping by us on every side. as our thoughts, memories, images, our feelings, are whipping past us, maintain steady and still in the mind. Check in, making sure the muscles in the face are still relaxed. And again, every time you feel yourself getting locked into a thought, memory or image, just lean back, finding more and more space. And notice and investigate the gaps between our thoughts, memories, and images. What is the nature or experience of our mind in between?
keep coming back, keep softening through the face, through the chest and the belly, feeling pliancy in the body and mind. Porous and spacious so that all feelings and thoughts, memories and images can arise and pass away. And investigate for yourself, is there somewhere in the mind, in the spaciousness that is unchanging? Something we come back to that is familiar time and time again. The thought may be one that's anxious or the thought may be one that's irritated. Maybe we have a memory, maybe we're planning. All of those can feel so different in the mind. But is there something that remains the same that we return to? And then we engage with this inquiry by just knowing the mind, feeling the mind, feeling our awareness and closely attending to the thoughts, memories, and images that arise and fall back once again, like waves returning back to the ocean. And gently coming back from the space of the mind to inhabit the senses of the body. Feeling the experience of the body being supported by a chair or bed beneath you. And again, noticing what's here in the body. What are the quality of sensation and where? For some of us, we may have a more expansive feeling of being in our body in this moment. Allow and invite the body to feel as expansive, as porous as it can.
feel this body to be a body of presence. And gently, without really shifting or changing anything, starting to wiggle your fingers and toes and blinking your eyes back into our shared space together. Thank you all for your practice. So the space of mind can be a bit confusing. We may not know where to look. And even for those of us who've had a lot of experience trying to look at the space of mind, we find that it's always changing. I would love to hear from folks tonight when they were looking for the space of mind, what did they find? So if you don't mind writing in the chat, the chat, that would be wonderful to know. What is the space of the mind? I remember the first time I heard Alan ask me this question and I literally had no idea what he was talking about. It was such a foreign concept, this idea that, um, that there's, there's actually kind of a mind um, and it has a space that isn't just our temporary thoughts and images. So I hear open and tenderness, charged, my heart. Good, very good. And I might ask um, Katie, if there are more questions, if people have questions about that practice, please write them into the chat. But I'm gonna go ahead and get started to, um, with our session, it, it looks like um, Chandra is not able to join. I'm gonna ask her if she can call in, because that would be lovely. Um, otherwise, we will go ahead and get started here. So I wanna begin by sharing with you a really beautiful koan or poem. Some of you may know this, it's by Zen master, Ehi Dogen. I am so sorry if I got that wrong. <laughs> I am sure it could be pronounced better. So this is the poem. Learn the backward step that turns your light inward to illuminate yourself. Body and mind of themselves will drop away and your original face will be manifest. Coming, going, the water birds don't leave a trace. Don't follow a path, midnight, no waves, no wind. The empty boat is flooded with moonlight. Enlightenment is like the moon reflected on the water. The moon does not get wet, nor is the water broken. Although its light is wide and great, the moon is reflected even in a puddle an inch wide. The whole moon and the entire sky are reflected in one dewdrop on the grass. So some of you may have heard this. I'm gonna copy the last part of it here. Um, it's, quite a, it's quite a common way of describing <clears throat> possibly what enlightenment is, especially this last part, this idea that it's like the moon reflected on the water, that this moon-like quality of luminescence and stillness, that that is our awake mind. And that our, our awake mind, it doesn't actually matter what is being presented to it. It will allow itself to be reflected, our awake mind, whether it's this tiny pool of rainwater or the vastness of the ocean. It reflects just the same. And it will reflect even, um, even if it's just like a, uh, I would say, um, kind of insignificant dewdrop on the top of a blade of grass. And I really like this evocation. It also reminds us that 
the kind of moonlight or luminescent quality of mind we may be seeking is only achieved with stillness. So it doesn't matter how beautiful the lake is, if it's turned up with all sorts of wind, we won't really be able to see the moon reflected. So that it is, again, this quality of stillness which we need in order to have that reflection. There's so many beautiful and amazing um, interpretations of this line. I always, I think it's interesting to think of the reflection of moonlight on water um, and that it, you know, it really shows us that the very strength of our practice or our awake nature, that we could emanate it um, in many places at once. It's not as though, oh, right now I'm just being enlightened in this one activity, but I don't have room to do that somewhere else at a different time. The moon will reflect itself in that light everywhere at the same time. So I think that's also a really nice invocation um, but what I, I want to start us off with is also thinking about, <laughs> um, you know, what is the unchanging nature of mind? I do think that this, uh, as it is said, unprecedented time is such a good time for Dharma. Uh, as many of you notice, a lot of the teachings that we've all heard are so real. You know, the teachings of the preciousness of human life are so poignant right now. The teachings on impermanence, not just, of course, of the many people whose lives are ending, but the impermanence also of all of the things that we thought would happen and how they would happen. We've had to let go of that. We've had to see the fundamental changing nature of reality just, oof, right, ripped right open. And, you know, we've also seen unbelievably powerfully interdependence. You know, just how much everything is connected to another thing. I was talking to a, a colleague earlier today who was describing how she recognized that anything she could think of ordering online to be delivered at her house, she really brought mindfulness to it, recognizing the whole chain of interdependent experiences that would need to be catalyzed in order for it to arise at her door. And was it worth it? Was the risk maybe of um, what might happen somewhere along that chain worth it? Or all the people involved who might have to be um, included in order to fulfill that. So there's just this real dense understanding of these core teachings. And then this one, this idea that there is a, um, an unchanging nature of mind. That, I love the idea of that. It, it sounds quite romantic to me. But when I think about what it means outside of the Dharma perspective, it can, be, um, it can be actually quite hard to understand. And it sounds like just a metaphor. But really, the unchanging nature of mind um, is what we were just looking into. Into the mind which exists when we're not thinking, when we're not imagining, when we're not totally focused on a task, we're not distracted. Um, all of these different aspects, the unchanging nature of mind is where everything arises from. And what's interesting is that often we have glimpses of this in meditation. And that's why I'm so curious to hear, uh, hear um, what it was like for people. Someone wrote, empty but full. You know, so to really get a sense of what is the nature of our mind between thoughts, memories, and images. Um, and, you know, when our mind is not being activated to be in one place or another, we can actually find that it's kind of nice. It's kind of beautiful. So there's a great deal of poetry, like the one just read, I just read to you all here, that really describes this, um, this luminescent quality of mind that there's actually a spaciousness of mind. And yet I think it's important for us to find it for ourselves. Maybe what we find the nature of our mind is actually it's kind of fuzzy and warm. Or maybe we find our mind feels more like a tapestry or a rug. All of these ideas of how it should feel just invite us or encourage us that the space of our own mind might be somewhere we enjoy being. And that in and of itself can be kind of confronting, <laughs> unfamiliar, not what we would have all expected. So that I think is really worthwhile. And, you know, if we look at the neuroscientific research um, on the mind and the brain, 
Katie, please pipe in here if you have interesting ideas. Um, what we see is that um, we can identify and map quite well a lot of the activity of the mind, thinking, even emotions to a certain extent. It's possible us to notice with like a lot of specificity, different activities in the brain. But what's really hard and arguably impossible is actually being able to notice what consciousness or awareness is like in the brain. And this is a really, I think, um, I think it's motivating for us to recognize that our own awareness, our own consciousness is not something that anybody else can tell us about. It is not something that anyone can measure, even with the most sophisticated equipment. Yeah, of course, they could tell us if we were thinking, if we were feeling, but this mind is vast. And the mind, interestingly, this unchanging nature of mind may not even reside in the brain. We're not sure. There's no conclusive evidence. I find that to be something I really love sharing with people. I respect deeply neuroscience. There's so much we can understand and learn. And yet I think it's important for us to realize truly the nature of the great mystery, that there's so much about human consciousness and our creativity, our imagination, our capacity for love and kindness that is unknown. <laughs> and that to me is quite exciting. So I think when we consider that this um, aspect of mind, um, you know, is actually spacious or open, then we can start to kind of try to understand for ourselves how can we understand it. So there's a wonderful philosopher and writer or author named Evan Thompson. Some of you may know him. He's a phenomenologist of mind, meaning he really kind of goes head to head in a meaningful way both with spiritual teachers and neuroscientists, and tries to get them to be really specific of, when you say mind, what do you mean by mind? Like, what are you actually talking about? And he, in a exchange with another researcher, wrote this beautiful um, piece about what does it mean to have this awareness or nature of mind? And he says that throughout the states of focused attention or open awareness, these other qualities or mindfulness, that throughout these states, there's still this luminosity of mind. And that the luminosity, maybe it seems to be a metaphor for describing actually the witnessing quality of consciousness. But this is a quality that isn't dependent on any object to be witnessed. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. That's already really, really heady. Essentially, this idea is that the luminous quality of our mind or the space of the mind itself it doesn't need to observe anything else. It is in itself this enormous spaciousness in which all things are experienced. I, don't, I hope that you find a little bit of inspiration in that. He says, consciousness is luminous because it reveals all objects without itself being an object. So consciousness is luminous because it discloses or reveals any object without itself being an object. So there's this space of mind in which like all things can arise. And I think what it, it really helps us point out is um, our bare awareness. And this isn't just our sensory experience. This isn't just, I feel the sense of experience in my legs, in my arms, I have a sense of smell or sight. Um, there's a different level of our sensory awareness in which we notice all things coming and going. So for just a moment, I invite you, without anything special, can you notice this unchanging nature of mind? This consciousness which is luminous, and yet it is not an object. Okay, thank you. And even if that didn't get you to a very um, tangible place, there might have been a moment of no thought, 
no feeling, no experience that was really getting in the way and instead just this spaciousness. And why am I spending so much time on talking about space of the mind and this unchanging quality? It's because this unchanging quality of the mind, this is our true refuge. This is that which will not be shut down. This is that which will not be no longer available to us. This is that which we no longer get to experience. This is that which we can always be cultivating. And that is, you know, um, it, it's kind of startling to recognize how quickly everything that we rely upon for our refuge can be taken away. And for many of us, that's a very real experience right now. There are a lot of everyday activities that we have learned to rely upon that have been supportive for us that aren't there. And so what remains, right? And some of the practices that we do to kind of unveil this nature of mind is we imagine as though we would lose all of our sense capacities. Like what if we could just no longer hear? Then there would be no receiving of Dharma talks. There would no, be no longer hearing of music. Okay, well, what would be left? Well, if we could no longer hear, we could still feel, right? We could still have that sense of feel, but what if our sense of touch, which also removed, so we couldn't feel anything. We couldn't feel our way around our kitties. Many of us have our kitties tonight. How lucky are we? And then what if not only could we not have that sense of hearing or touch, but we couldn't taste or smell? What would remain? Well, we are still able to see. Okay, so we're reading and we're watching. But then imagine that that sight is also gone. What remains then? This incredible capacity of our mind. And I will tell you that it's, it's deeply inspiring to um, start working on the mind when we recognize how invaluable it is as a refuge. When we realize that we don't know what will happen next. We don't know what other deprivations may lay ahead or challenges or struggles. And yet we know that we bring our mind with us. And that may be quite startling and unpleasant news for some of you. I know that this last weekend, for example, on Saturday, um, I and some friends I know all were really struggling. It was a hard day. And that inner world, it just felt almost unnavigable. Like how on earth am I going to make it through if I can't even work with my own mind? So it's not as though I'm suggesting that, yay, nature of unchanging mind, let's go there. It's always wonderful. And yet we can cultivate it at its most basic quality and start to have a sense not only of, yeah, this is a place that is safe. This is a place that's reliable. We can start to cultivate a deep yearning to be in that space. That actually that is our true ground. And not because we want to avoid and just like, oh yeah, social distancing's over. I'm just going to stay here. I'm good. I, I had my fill of people for my lifetime. I'm going to hang out in nature of mine. Um, no, not at all. One thing that's really been highlighted for me in this time, among the work I do both with healthcare professionals and others, is how much people are struggling with their empathic distress, feeling the hurt of the world and not knowing exactly where to put it, right? There is so much struggle, challenge, and suffering among probably even within, you know, um, as much as we can get our arms around of our own communities. So how can we understand that? How can we make space for that suffering? There's also the amount of suffering and struggling of people who we don't know, right? People who are really having a hard time making ends meet. People who are exposing themselves on a daily basis to enormous amount of um, risk through this illness. How can we hold them in our hearts? And the real key with empathic distress or that feeling of overwhelm that happens is we don't yet have enough space for ourselves in order to hold others. So when I teach this in the secular context, I don't get to go that far. 
often I, I talk about this need to really care for ourselves and then care for others. That's really important. That's enormously important. But there's more than that. There's also this ability to cultivate that nature of mind, that feeling that gives us expansiveness and space, and that feeling that also starts to slowly, slowly, slowly erode us as distinct entities from others. So ego dissolution, again, never a popular topic among the secular crowd, um, and yet always such an important move for us if we want to reduce our suffering. So the more and more we can reduce a sense of me and mine, the more and more we increase a sense of ours and we. And we have that sense of ours and we, and it's, it's interesting, it's we break down the barriers and there's less struggle and less difficulty in trying to hold out the pain of other people. It's not different from ours, it's the same. And it's really interesting how these <clears throat> weave together. If we recognize this, um, this nature of mind, this unchanging mind, we realize that like the sky, it can't be completely, um, it can't be scarred, it can't be broken. It can't be anything that happens within it, there will still be more space. And I think there's many people who fear their own minds. I don't know about you all, but you tell people you go on a retreat and they're like, are you crazy? Just you and your mind? I would never do that. That sounds terrifying. I don't want to spend time with my mind. And so this idea of making friends with our mind and what we find isn't a more um, intense version of me. What we find is actually a more expansive version of just beingness. And that from there, our compassion is just fluid. We aren't as stuck. We don't feel as like held down by that love that we feel for other people, that concern and care. It's such an interesting paradox that the more we can care for others and let them in completely, the less pain that we feel. And again, this has to be something I, I believe that we touch into or that we feel. Uh, it can't just be explained. You know, you can't say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just going to try out letting in all the pain of the world. Let's see how that goes. For most of us, that would really flatten us quite quickly. But if we can feel into a spaciousness of our heart and of our mind, that possibility starts to naturally arise. Because compassion, as many of you know, isn't something we actually have to learn. Compassion is something that is innate. It is already always there for us. And it wants to flow. We don't have to generate it, it wants to flow. And yet it can get kind of blocked off when we are overly self-concerned. So empathic distress, one way to understand that feeling of suffering that we have for others, sometimes in the psychological terms, it's called self-related concern. So I'm actually upset because it's, it's affecting me. I'm thinking about how hard it is for this person, but my focus is actually on how hard it is for me. So how do we create more expansiveness and more openness in the mind? We invite in over and over and over this unchanging quality. So I think right there we see how compassion and this wisdom go so hand in hand as they're often taught together. So I would love to hear from some of you um, questions here. I don't know, Katie, if you saw any that came in. Um, I haven't been checking the chat so much here. There was one about consciousness. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Okay, here we go. This is a juicy one. Some posit that consciousness is inherent in matter. I'm not sure which field this comes from. Physics, philosophy? Oh, that's the end of the question. So, so <laughs> <laughs> you can answer that any way you'd like. Yeah, inherent. Yeah, oh, it's a it's a beautiful question. It's um, I would say yes, but that's not with my scientific hat on, right? I don't know about you guys, but if I if you have have you spent time in nature and recognized that almost all living beings are conscious? Because I have, the trees, the plants, you know, the wind, um, nothing outside of consciousness, and yet um, only limited research shows that there's 
some level of um, of that like consciousness of plants and trees that they have some form of communication and if they have a form of communication they have some form of awareness i find that to be quite um comforting actually to know that there is a consciousness and a greater consciousness there uh, i'd be curious other folks questions on um that idea that we already have everything we need here in this unchanging mind. And possibly it might even be the true ground of our compassion. Also happy to field um, other questions about how to apply this right now in these conditions. We have one of those from Pamela. Okay. Um, she says, I feel so happy that you're bringing this. It's really grounding and helpful. Can you say more about the feeling into it part? Mm. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, some teachers that I've sat with, you know, I, I gave that instruction of leaning back in your mind. Different instructions will work for different people. That one really helped me. Um, there was a sense at which I got to kind of let go of the egoic structures enough to then see and feel the spaciousness of mind. The reason I bring up the feelingfulness, um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to share one other quote from you, uh, for, quote with you from uh, Evan Thompson. You know, he has a, uh, he has an interesting quote here on, he says, the neuroscience might equate the brain with the mind, but this idea is confused. It's like saying that flight is inside the wings of a bird. The mind is relational. It's a way of being in relation to the world. You need a brain just as birds need wings, but the mind exists at a different level, the level of embodied being in the world. So his, his first book with Francisco Varela was in called The Embodied Mind. So when I say feeling into it, literally feeling the body into that spaciousness. Um, again, it's, it's really provocative and interesting for us to try to um, move away from this idea that our mind and consciousness exist from the neck up. And really notice, like, when I'm having a thought, is it really in here? Where is that thought? Is it in the body at all? That just gets you into this really exciting kind of uh, true beginner's mind of what is it like to have thoughts? What is it like to have feelings in the body that we can feel into our consciousness? Okay, I see some other questions here. Aha, thank you, Lonnie, uh, giving us some information about a um, consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe. That might be Stan, hard to say. Yes, that was Stan. I know these two. I was like, that seems like Stan. So for those interested, uh, physicist Andre Lind and Peter Russell. Um, and then Claudia asks, when you talk about cultivating a space of mind as a refuge, does that mean that when our mind is devoid of thoughts, images, sensations, just the pleasure of emptiness? Yeah, that's right. And um, Alan Wallace will call this the, uh, the kind of natural wellspring of our own goodness. As Chogyam Trumpa would call it our, um, our basic goodness. It's unconstructed and uncontingent. So it's not like, I feel good uh, when I'm doing something that makes me feel good. And what's really insidious about this is, um, for a long time I had a relationship with my four immeasurables practices in which I kind of used them in a transactional way to feel good. And I was like, those are my refuge. But realized it wasn't actually naturally resting in just me. It was still me doing something. I hope that makes sense to people. So when we're thinking of that real, true, natural refuge, it's not because you are uniquely so special in you or you're doing anything or you're receiving anything. It's that at our basic kind of unstructured uh, experience, it's not that it's, it's, it's dumb or it's deaf or it's blind. It's not a um, kind of infantile experience. It is unbelievably wise. It's just that space of our mind before we get all caught up in rumination. Some of you may be familiar with this term of default mode network. This is really 
I love when science happens on accident. Um, so the default mode network describes a way of, honestly, of rumination, a way to describe what we are often always doing in between things. So when we think of what isn't the nature of our unchanging mind, we can think of the default mode network. So here I am in between doing something and I'm not resting in the luminous <laughs> nature of my mind. I'm kind of like thinking about this. I'm kind of thinking about that. I'm kind of just like totally not in my body. And it is a non-directive way of ruminating that was discovered when they asked people in the scanner to do nothing. And we, we have no capacity for this. We're not good at doing nothing, right? Even our mind is habituated towards doing a little bit of something. And so even though this natural unconditioned place of mind is always already here, we actually have to work at it in order to discover it and start to kind of continue this familiarization with it and then cultivate the conditions that allow it to arise. I was thinking the other night, I was watching, as I mentioned, the moon, um, doing this open eye meditation. And I saw someone walk through the park um, on their phone um, using the, uh, the, the flashlight app. And I mean, bright moon, like you can see your shadow, like you definitely don't need a flashlight. But if you're always tending towards the outside, you're going to miss that, right? You're going to miss this own luminescence of your own mind if you're looking to it constantly from the outside. So familiarizing with it, we do in, in meditation, right? By feeling into what it's like to have that experience of inner fullness or inner goodness. But also the cultivation. We actually have to work at creating the causes and conditions where it can arise. It's subtle. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be available to us. We're like, okay, I'm ready. Let's, okay, right now. Even though all day what I've been doing is being busy, being active, feeling frustrated and irritated, distracting myself, eating too much, uh, maybe like trolling online, like whatever I'm doing. Then I'm like, okay, nature of mind. No. And this is where, again, all the teachings come together. We actually have to be leading an ethical life. We have to be one that's wholesome and that's supportive for us to get access to those great jewels. Um, great question. Oops, I see another question. Ooh. Um, yes, okay. Wow, now great, so many, okay. Um, Deborah's asking, am I referring to our essence, our deeper, that's deeper than the mind, the sort of gap between our thoughts when all goes still during meditation? Um, when you want to say, stay, yes. Deborah, yes, it's that, um, I don't know if I would say it's deeper than the mind. This is a big semantic conversation, right? So I, I've been using some words interchangeably, awareness, um, our unchanging nature. Some people would even call it consciousness in which that is included. Um, the mind, I think, is a really nice word. The brain is only one part of the mind, right? Like the wings are one part of the bird. I love Evan's uh, metaphor with that, that the wings are an important part of flight. The brain is an important part of thinking and consciousness, but it is not entirely just that. Um, and I do think when we get a, a glimpse of it in meditation, often the feeling is quite nurturing, sometimes even called blissful. Um, and then at that moment when we're like, I want to keep it, and then it goes away, right? Um, I had a, a question here about talking. I, I just started to talk about empathic distress and then kind of moved away. Um, and, you know, how do we move through empathic distress as practitioners, which is a little different than what I would, again, suggest possibly for folks without a practice. I think with empathic distress as practitioners, um, you know, there's a couple of really, really, really interesting phrases, lojong phrases for us to keep in mind. The ones where we recognize that we can turn all adversity into the path and that we can be grateful to everyone. I think when we have the distress, there is an immediate message. It should not be this way. It should be a different way. And often, almost everyone would agree, like, yes, this person should not be suffering that way. That is unjust. That is unfair. And yet, we just have to, in some ways, yield to the reality which is in front of us. And from there, our compassion will be more open. When we are fighting against it, saying it shouldn't be this way, 
that is often when we get that agitated feeling or that distressed feeling, that overwhelm. So there's a way in which we have to at first just allow the suffering that is there without trying to change it or shift it. You know, we can again bring forth this idea that this suffering isn't without purpose or meaning. I think also we have a harder time tolerating our suffering if we feel as though it's happening without any meaning or purpose. So we bring in those phrases of the lojong of this, all this adversity is going to help me on my path. As though each of these, each of these different ways I'm facing suffering was a way that I was sharpening my blade of compassion. So I can be even more and more precise. And then of course, Tonglen practice in which we do that really, that kind of sacred transformation of taking on the suffering because we want to hopefully alleviate some part of the suffering for all beings. So you're almost including all of those. You're realizing that taking it in will transform you. You're also recognizing that your greatest aspiration is to be of service. And when you're operating in that place of Tonglen, often the preliminary practice that Chandra and I taught a couple weeks ago, the preliminary practice is really forging those inner pathways of love and spaciousness, right? So with compassion, it's almost as though how wide can we open ourselves? How wide can we open our heart so that everything can move through, right? That's um, the greater the expansiveness of our compassion, the less impact that it can make when it kind of is, is moving through us. Again, that's a felt experience. And my specific um, kind of uh, instructions or advice would be to try it out, try these different forms of feeling into. So if any of us could bring to mind right now someone that we are deeply worried about, and we can almost immediately feel a heartful kind of quality of that care. And can we make that heartful quality of care of this person who I know right now is suffering? Feel as though there was space for that, that it was not just relegated to the, you know, area between our eyes or within our head, that it was not just relegated into the heart, that there was so much space for this. Almost as though we were behind it and above it and around it, that we were through it, and that we could feel this heartful caring from all those directions. And those are the eyes which we then kind of see through. That's how we see our compassion. So it's really, I think it's a really, um, it's a really good experiment right now for all of us to find how can we be empathic without shutting down? How can we feel compassion without feeling overwhelmed? And part of it, there has to be this belief that this has meaning and that this will transform me and that I have enough to give. And those are all cognitive ideas, but they can really be influenced if we are constantly practicing it and demonstrating to ourselves that it is true. Um, okay, so do you think that bringing the less secular parts of these concept healthcare providers could be helpful? Yes, thank you, Keith. I do do that, check me out, Greater Good Science Center. We're having a big free three-day summit in three weeks. Everyone can join. You'll hear the most secular version of what I just said ever. Um, and there'll be a lot of wonderful providers. Um, I can share that link. Uh, is compassion an inherent characteristic of the spacious mind? Ha ha! Such a good question. In other words, does contacting spacious mind automatically generate compassion? Oh, so good. Such a good question. Um, yes. There's no separation. There's no separation between compassion and spaciousness. And I think that that's a really you know, it's really interesting to feel into the quality of the mind. You know, luminous, it's just a concept, right? And, and I remember uh, myself sometimes getting caught up in my practice, just trying to find luminous. And I almost missed out on the fact that it was warm. Because to me, luminous seems cool, like the moon. 
And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, my heart is melted right now. I missed out, right? So I think um, my guess is that question um, coming from Aaron and Jean is that you felt it. And so you know that it is there, that there's a way in which you're experiencing it. Um, and it's, it's really sweet. You know, the nature of our own mind is not like a clinical empty room, like, okay, everything's empty. It is so um, welcoming and rich, right? Our basic essence, it's, it's really sweet. And of course we can see this, um, you know, um, in younger in younger beings i think they have more access and quality to just a spaciousness of their mind without the contrivances of who i am and what i do and if i matter and if i deserve to be happy right now so thank you for that question um there are a few people who are in need and want my attention it's not necessarily a zero sum but listening and being present with them does take something out of me opening up to the hurting universe seems like a lot unless i turn the volume way down. But when I'm listening to someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's hard to turn the volume down. That's a great question. So with the one-on-one, -on -one, I again, I, I am gonna come back to the exact same um, kind of advice, which is really anchoring in the body. So what can often happen when we are one-on-one -on -one and there's a more intimacy, um, <clears throat> what happens in psychological terms is called emerging in which we actually, at some point, kind of lose a sense of ourself as separate from the other person. We are naturally resonant, head to toe, to empathize with others, and we feel it, right? So that's why if we're watching a movie and someone is getting attacked, we go backwards too, right? Like we feel it, we're, it's happening to us. And so as much as we can, we really practice on establishing that kind of, um, kind of inner sanctum, um, I, I find that I can access that enormously through my belly. That's a very stable place for me to be. And so notice if you're rising up to the heart. Notice if you're rising up to the head. And by rising up, I mean you just notice that the quality of your energy or attention is more in the heart. Often we think our compassion should be just flowing from the heart. But often that's actually a kind of a surface level sentimentality. Our compassion is far more anchored and strong than just the sentimentality of the heart. And so we don't wanna get cognitive and clinical and remove the beauty of our compassion. And yet we wanna feel that we have a stable base. So that's again, um, another moon reference in Buddhism, which I love. There's the teaching of the Buddha on not confusing the moon with the fingers pointing at the moon. So all teaching, right, about our practice, about our mind, is me pointing to your moon. Here's your moon, it's luminous. Your moon can have the stability, um, but sometimes we forget and we, instead we focus on the fingers. <laughs> so this idea of all of these ideas, these concepts I'm providing to you, really remember that they have to be kind of um, tried on. Okay, so another question here. Um, can you talk more through the exercise of strategy and empathic distress? Yes, I think I did that in work settings. Okay. Um, I'm inspired that your response to this crisis is to return to the teachings of awakening in the nature of mind. Can you speak a little bit more about your process? Yes, Laura, thank you. Yeah. Um, I really, um, like all of you, um, I find myself getting caught up so much in the emotional processes of what's happening. And as someone who loves emotion and emotion awareness, there's a way in which I can almost get a little too caught up into those emotional processes. So I'm, I'm, I'm so interested to notice like, ooh, there goes contempt. Oh my God, now I feel guilt. Oh, and there's some irritation. Oh, I'm happy. And just like watching the kind of waves coming and going. And though there is a lot um, to be learned from this time, I need rest, <laughs> you know, I need rest and deep, deep rest. And deep rest really comes from the nature of the unchanging mind. And it's, it's a really fine line here because I think we could <clears throat> easily 
ignore and avoid what's happening in the world through our practice, spiritually bypassed. Say, it's really tough out there. I'm going to go to this one refuge there. Nothing can go wrong. So as long as we keep in mind our intention, our intention is to be of service to all beings. Our intention is to show up with compassion however we can. But we can only do so if we are ourselves capacitated. And that requires the deepest refreshment. That requires going to that stillness of mind. And I'm very fortunate to have some dear friends who are practitioners and who've been sharing with me what they're doing, how they're coping. And I'm learning. You know, I had um, a friend who's on this, um, who's with us this evening was sharing that he's been really going inward and doing his own practice. And that really inspired me and motivated me to consider, though I love giving in this moment, how can I also cultivate the space for that? And what's the deepest well that I can go to? So thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, as a mental health professional, so this is from Dean, uh, I do not know how I could survive these times without my, he said drama practice, which I think is funny, but I bet he means dharma practice, or she. Um, I, I really agree. And you know what else? Um, I think that we can, I think that we can, um, as practitioners, almost have this, how could it be to be like those people who don't have practice? Like we can almost feel really good about ourselves um, in that way. And when I really think of the Dharma and what it is at its most basic essence, when I see it show up among people who are not practitioners, it's kindness. And I've seen so much profound kindness. And people who are able to, without the practice, generate, sustain, and share kindness. Um, and so that's been really meaningful. And, and like, yeah, I mean, literally, the practice is set up for times like this. There has always been times like this. There will always be times like this. And that's a really nice reminder. So in case you were kind of slacking off for a while, you're like, oh boy, am I motivated? Because we just don't know. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, again, I just, I'm totally touched. Um, all of us go through incredibly difficult, challenging times. And often we feel like we're the only one, right? When we have the death of a parent or um, are struggling with mental health. And we just, you know, we can't wait until it's over and that then we can be like everybody else. And there's something so sweet about this moment where all of us, are going through so much struggle and difficulty. And then no one actually is free from that. No matter how many resources they have, there is a challenge, there is a struggle, there's a limitation. Um, this is such a powerful time to practice that sense of common humanity and to let our hearts be so tender with that. It's never not true. So four months ago, this was still true. All of us are suffering. All of us are connected in our suffering. And now we get to like feel what that's like. Four months ago, there's always like profound uncertainty in the world. We never know what's going to happen. But right now, just unbelievable. It's really, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. How do we rest without going to sleep? You know, that's, um, I think, um, okay, sorry, and then done. Um, I've been really struggling with sleep in this time. Um, and it's, it's really been an area that's, you know, um, I think hardest to find a true refuge. And, you know, I think, I think when we are underslept, the world is even more terrifying. <laughs> and if any of us have flexibility with our work and are working from home, we really have to be kind to ourselves and rest whenever we can. If we're not able to rest through the night, we have to rest whenever we can. Um, and so Donna asked about, do you wake up in the morning and bring your intention to mind, anchoring the body, and then anchoring in the body when working with others? Beautiful. So thank you, Donna. I think that's a great advice for mental health and healthcare professionals. So if, if we can keep our intention in mind, and, and by intention in this case, it's may I have compassion without suffering empathic distress. So may my heart be open enough 
to include everyone, and may I also have the resilience to show up. So that is, that's quite a, a, a beautiful intention. And it's one that if we keep in mind, it might help us anchor in the body, not merge or lose ourselves so much with others. So I think that that's a, a really, a really good one. Um, oh, I'm really, I am loving all your questions here. And what I think might be nice for us um, together is to do a practice where we open up into something greater. So we do a bit of Tonglen together, of turning towards the struggle and suffering and seeing if we can just transform it with the breath. So coming right back home to the body and the breath. And feeling what's here right now, getting a sense at the embodied level of the quality of mind, of the emotions, whatever has been stirred up in our session together, whatever has been settling down. And whatever you're feeling, Imagine as though you could create space around it, within it and through it. If there is a sense of ease, make space in and around the ease. If there is a sense of lingering uncertainty, make space around the uncertainty. And before we begin our Tonglen practice, we just notice this inner environment and attempt as much as possible <clears throat> to soothe or resolve anything that is already open or hard, <clears throat> challenging or difficult. Through our breath, we really take into account and notice whatever is inside of us right now that's hurting, that's lonely, it feels rough. And then through our exhale, we give ourselves the kindness we need. So we're drawing in and seeing and holding what is hard. And we're exhaling and giving ourselves exactly what we need. And for some of us, this really opens up a whole well of care. And for others of us, there's still the aching, the sense of not being totally connected or cared for. We take a next step now of bringing to mind at least a semicircle of loving beings who care about you. These could be people who are alive or no longer with us. Imagining them facing you, beaming their smiles, radiating love and kindness towards you. Feel and imagine their well wishes. How much they would love to hold you with care and comfort in all the parts that are hurt, all the parts that are stuck, all the parts that are heavy and invite in their love and their radiance. Inhale, drawing it in, and then exhale, allowing it to circulate and permeate throughout the whole body. If it's hard to think of specific beings, you could think of whatever comes to mind easily. Imagine the sun giving you radiance. Imagine the ocean giving you buoyancy. Just feel into receiving the support of another, that love and care.
And then imagine this semicircle of beings as they come to your back. Now they're radiating towards your back. And you can allow them to be there, supporting you from behind, giving you that strength. And feel into your heart. Feel and imagine here that there is lightness, there is openness, there's infinite capacity of care. That no matter how much care you have given, it has never run out. Feel that unending wellspring of your own basic goodness. And then gently bring to mind just one person in your life right now who is struggling. Someone who is sick or someone who is caring for someone who is sick. Someone for whom the isolation is taking a special toll. And notice what it's like immediately in the space of the heart, the mind and the body to bring forth this person. Open up into the tenderness of caring about this person. Notice if there's parts of you that get heavy or constricted or tight and open, open, open. Bringing them to mind vividly. <clears throat> and imagining as though you could take on some of their burden. You could transform it for them. Feel this heartfelt aspiration, this desire for care. <clears throat> and then imagining as though through your breath, you could draw in and take in some of what is hard for this person into the radiant light of your heart. And you could exhale this outrageous aspiration. May this person be completely free. May this person be well and happy. May they know ease and peace. And the important part here is to really feel that aspiration in words, knowing, of course, you may not be able to change and help, but knowing that this process allows your heart to maintain its openness to strengthen its radiance. So again, drawing in, imagining this person, your care for them. Imagining taking on this heartfelt aspiration to transform some of their suffering. Bringing that into the radiance of your heart and extending out the light in all directions. And continuing to do so for a couple more breaths. If it starts to feel heavy, remember everyone at your back supporting you, also sending you love. And feel into spaciousness around wherever there's a density of feeling. And then, as one more great act, of compassion. Imagine all the people who like this treasured loved one are struggling in the same way. All the beings across the planet and extend and open your heart for them too. Extending from this place of strength, this place of openness, feeling the dignity and uprightness of our spine, feeling the softness and openness of our heart and belly. We invite in as part of our training, as warriors of compassion, we invite in the suffering of these beings and engage this heartfelt, radiant, joyous aspiration. May all these beings be free. May they all know peace. May they all feel ease. Feel the strength of opening the heart in this way. 
Feel your own presence grounded here. Feel the heart open, porous. Feel the mind and its stillness, its calmness. And let's consider dedicating our practice so that all beings everywhere could feel the strength of their compassion, could feel the openness of their heart, could know the natural luminosity and clarity of their unchanging mind. Thank you all for your practice. Sorry I went over a bit, but you're already home. So you don't have to go anywhere, it's pretty nice. Sorry to keep you. Um, there's probably some announcements. I wanna kick off by just saying that, yeah, it's a real highlight of my week to be with you all. It really uh, means a lot to be together in these times. Uh, I know Chandra would have loved to be here, so I'm sending her love as well. Um, and we are going to do a day of practice together on April 25th. Um, and that will be in the morning, it will be totally silent meditation. And in the afternoon, we'll work with the Lojong slogans um, and develop our Tonglen. So that is something to look forward to. I realize we need things to look forward to. It really helps right now. Um, and as you all know, San Francisco Dharma Collective is a completely volunteer run and donation based organization. For many of you, it's really hard right now financially, you feel no obligation whatsoever. Um, if you can and you have the means to support us, it means so much. We are eager to keep this online um, aspect running, but really aspire and hope to get ourselves back to the brick and mortar. So it would be really lovely to have you and your support if that's possible. Um, Katie or Noam, do you guys have further announcements? Yeah, there are a few exciting things coming up. Um, the next two Fridays, we have Isukuchiardi at the same link, um, doing two very interesting uh, practice and lecture and Q&A evenings. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, her presence is incredible. She has a depth of knowledge that is also incredible. So the next two Fridays, mark your calendars for that. Check out the Greater Good Science Center, as Eve mentioned. They're doing some really cool stuff there. Uh, so look at their website. And on Sunday, uh, Chandra will be leading the uh, Tara mantra on Facebook. So if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you know how powerful that practice is. Um, and that's on Sunday, so don't miss that. And the best way to know what's happening with us in this rapidly shifting online world of peak uncertainty uh, is to sign up for the newsletter. Because, for example, between the last well of being and this well of being, we had to put a password on the Zoom and subscribers to the newsletter got to find that out right away. So subscribe to the newsletter because we can announce things there quickly to everyone. And there's one last thing I want to say before I, I want to hand it over to Mace and Pamela just because I enjoyed seeing them so much last week. Um, but if there's someone who you used to see at this uh, sit when we were back in the building and you haven't noticed them online, say hi to them and just check in. Let them know we're online and just see how they're doing. Um, sangha is Sangha no matter where it meets. And this is a time where it's critical to check in on our, on our regular friends and our Dharma friends. So uh, take a look around, around the room. And if you have a Dharma friend who isn't here, uh, send them an email or send them a text or something and say hi. Okay, Mace, Pamela. Hi, everyone. Um, just to follow up with what Eve was talking about in terms of just helping to keep the community supported financially. Um, someone I was hearing recently was talking about this idea of um, 
inspired giving um, and just finding in ourselves like what's available for you know financial contribution to help run the zoom and maybe make a little backstock of funds to pay for the brick and mortar and then also contribute to our teachers um, all these important opportunities for us to consider just by checking in like to our heart and being like what what can i do and what do i what do i want to do you know and just doing that and knowing that that is actually the right thing for us to do um and i was really moved by that that talk and that idea of generosity and um they the person was pulling it back to like the early tradition of of dana or of you know the paramita of generosity and it's such a neat place for me it's a neat place when i'm able to be like what's in my heart and and what's available to offer um and so kind of as a you know a request to help the community financially um that as maybe a ground to to sink into and consider what's available and of course if there's not funds to throw down for the Dharma Collective right now, you know, then just your presence and your participation and just being here with us, I mean, is itself kind of immeasurable. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we, you probably noticed we poke at the computer, we're going through the gallery and like, we're seeing our people, you know, and that's such a strength. So thank you all for coming. And, if you can and are inspired to make a financial contribution, that is totally welcome and appreciated. Thanks all. Mm. Be well, everyone. And if